Hello, Roger Bisbee here from Skill Builder, and I think you can see from the attire that I'm wearing that it's blooming cold out here. Lovely and bright, beautiful day, but we've got a north wind blowing and it's absolutely icy. Most people aren't going out, quite honestly, they're not working. Anyway, I've got to work, I've got no choice. So what I've got is I've got a few layers of thermals on and once I get moving, I'll be all right. We've got the overhang here for the soffit. When I get to this gable end, I haven't put an overhang, like they call a ladder on here yet. All the other houses around here don't have an overhang. They just sail the tiles over. If you look over next door, for example, there, they don't have an overhang, or they've got a minimal two inch overhang. It's not great because I like a good overhang because it protects that gable end wall a bit more, especially from staining, from runoff. I'm gonna put the overhang on here, even though it doesn't match the other properties. And the other reason I'm gonna put the overhang on here is because we've got the valley coming down and we've got the soffit here, so we'd have to do some weird box section thing here. It wouldn't look great. So I bite the bullet, I'm gonna put that overhang on today. The problem it causes me, let's just look up here. The problem that it causes me is that I've got an overhang there. Do I now put an overhang here and bring this out? Okay, I could do that. I wouldn't mind doing that actually because it would be good, good protection to this wall. But if I do it that end, I've got to do it the other end. And then I'm over the neighbors. Then suddenly I'm over sailing the neighbors. And quite honestly, there can be problems with that. I've had a word with my mate Dave, who's a roofer, a good roofer. And we did a bit of a video call here and I showed him the problem. And he said to me, why don't you just put a PVC barge board direct onto the brickwork so that it looks the same as that but you haven't got the overhang because obviously what you do one end of the roof you've got to do the other otherwise the whole thing is not balanced up on the on the building if i put a barge board on there overhang on there it's all going to look roughly the same unless you're a roofer and then you would go oh that's a bit different on the other end i can talk to the neighbor and hopefully she'll go for putting a barge board over that end because that'll give her wall a little bit of protection as well and actually there's a bit of step flashing around there needs repointing so if i keep her sweet tell her i'll do the repointing while i'm doing it So I like to use a little spinner for this, Roger, with a one mil metal blade on. It's one. absolutely perfect, because it's tricky with a handsaw. It's all right with a hacksaw, but even still, this, you can, don't tell the scaffolder, but you can put it straight on his board. Yeah, don't do that, don't cut for his board. Well, we'll only, we'll only scrape it, like a shoe. Just stick it over here. Nine and a half inches. Mark that up. Oh, look at this, what an assistant. Hold that it's a good cut. Holding that screen, really. And it's like if you're making up the mitered ones for the corners, it's just such a nice cut. Oh, if you yeah. get the right blade, it doesn't burn, so it doesn't stick together. You don't get any furring up. It's absolutely perfect. Okay. That's the length, probably not. Long. It's to length, yep. Yeah. Just slot it in, yeah. Just cover it up a bit and put a hand to it. That'll hold it. And then I'll just get that joint together. These poly pins, they do tend to bend a bit. I'm not nailing the right one, that won't put it yet. Mark the lines, yeah. 50 and 150. That keeps it away from the rebate. And then, all right, pin them all. Pin them all. Where did you put my little block? It's there. Thank you. First one in. That's it.
So here we're gonna be doing the roof. We've already actually done quite a bit of the roof up there, as you can probably see, but the, that was raining when we did that. It was just too difficult to film it. So we've kept the filming for this little bit here, which is just basically a scaled down version of the bigger roof. So everything that happened on the big roof is gonna happen on a small roof, only less of it. So what we've got here, we've got the rafters, we've got those bird's mouth over the plate here. The whole thing is tied in there with the ceiling collars. We've got the ridge plate up the top. We've got some straps, which are basically tying that gable end wall in, in my opinion, doing hardly anything at all, but that's what they want. They want that strapped in to stop it blowing out. And down here, we've got an eaves tray, which we're gonna put the felt onto, and that hangs over the front there and goes into the gutter. So that's quite a nice idea because it saves you draping your felt over into the gutter. That's always, sometimes that even flaps in the wind. When it comes to the felt or the membrane as they now call it, we've got a breathable membrane because this is not a ventilated roof. We're gonna close this roof in, we're gonna keep most of the air out and we're gonna lay this membrane in. There are loads and loads of membranes on the market. You can go and get a membrane for about 40 pounds a roll. Now, if I put this in perspective, this whole job is done with two rolls of membrane. And those two rolls of membrane are costing something like 230 quid, somewhere around there anyway. That's quite expensive. You could go and get two rolls of membrane for 40 quid each. But the difference is, is that an approved membrane? Has it been tested? Is it a good quality membrane? Because once you put that roof on and you find that your membrane doesn't actually breathe, even though it says it's a breathable membrane, it doesn't actually move the moisture through. What are you gonna do? Your roof is on, it's too late to change it. Now, the danger of having a non-breathing membrane in there is that all that moisture that's in there is going to build up inside there and cause condensation and damp within the roof. It used to be cleared by the ventilation, but now we're trying to make the buildings warmer and cut down on that ventilation. If you haven't got a good membrane which will handle that moisture, think about it like in terms of Gore-Tex jackets. You know, Gore-Tex jackets, they move the moisture through. You go and buy a cheap one, says it's breathable, it costs you 20 quid and it doesn't do the job. We all know that. This is just about as good as you can get. It's Permo 40 the NG SK squared. Now, this is a four ply membrane. That helps it wick the moisture through, but it's also got reinforcing in it. So that reinforcing means that when you put it on, it's not gonna tear so easily. You can leave the whole thing storm battened in until you're ready to put the tiles on. You can leave it for a few weeks even. And believe me, we had the snow on the other roof in between and we didn't get a drop of moisture through this membrane. So it's well worth spending what amounts to maybe three times the amount of money, but on the total job, we're only talking about 150 quid extra if you like. And this way, you can make sure you've got something on the roof which is gonna last. If you're getting a roofer in, make sure that they go for something decent and don't just pocket the difference because I've seen so much tap put on the roof, it's gonna last about 20 years and then they're gonna have trouble, even if it doesn't cause that problem on condensation. Now, another thing that people do is they stretch this membrane drum tight across the rafters. They tack it down here and they pull it tight. Now, if you pull it tight, what happens is when you've got the batten going over the top, the moisture collects behind the batten. The way that breather membranes work, as I've just said, is they move the moisture through the membrane. All that moisture that's in the house is coming through the membrane. And then it has to go somewhere. It has to trickle down on the outside just in beads of, of moisture. And that's happening all year round, by the way. That's not just a, a winter thing. That moisture is trickling down on the outside there and it eventually finds its way into the gutter. If you put a batten on there and you've got that membrane pulled tight underneath, then there's nowhere for that moisture to go other than to be soaked up into the batten. So what you've got is a situation where you've got a good considerable amount of moisture sometimes in houses coming through the roof, being soaked up by the batten, sitting there, going into the fixings around the battens, rotting the timber around the fixings, just not a great situation. But the other thing that happens is when you get cold weather, all that moisture that's sitting there ices up. So suddenly 
you've got a sheet of ice underneath your tiles all the way over your membrane. What's going to happen to the breather membrane then? It's not going to do its job, is it? Because it's covered with ice, the moisture is trapped inside the house, you're heating the house up, the whole thing is getting more and more steam, if you like, it's getting more and more moisture into that roof space and suddenly you've got a situation where, I've seen this, where you get water dropping down onto the ceilings inside and people think it's a leaking roof and they go up into their loft they're horrified to find that the whole thing is like a turkish bath we fix the membranes then we want to work out where our first baton goes and the way we do that is we take our tile and we hang the tile over there we want 50 millimeters of overhang into the gutter there so we measure the 50 millimeters there and then we position our baton behind our nibs these are the nibs on the back of the tile here, and that will give us the position for our first batten. After that, we work out the battens by measuring from that first batten to the last batten, which finishes up somewhere around 50 millimeters short of the ridge. That can vary according to what tiles and what ridge you're using, but say 50 millimeters short. So we do a measurement from here to the top of the ridge, minus 50 millimeters. That gives us the total raft to run, if you like, from there. And then we work out what spacings we need. Now all these tiles have got a minimum and a maximum spacing, what they call the gauge. So you can get an overlap of 100 millimeters, that's the head lap, they call that. And that basically, obviously, is your security there. You see people do that sometimes, and then the water can drive up underneath. So it's in the book. These are Redlands tiles, and they're renowned tiles. So if you look on the Redland website, you look at renown, it tells you what the maximum head lap is. Now that varies according to the pitch of the roof. This is 33 and a half degree roof, so we know that the Minimum head lap that you can have on there is 75 millimetres. So 75 millimetres will give us the maximum batten spacing we're allowed to have on that. And then we work out how many battens we need. It's easy enough to just measure from there to there and work it out and get that batten spacing in precisely. 